Thank you for tuning in to Sanctuary Deliverance Church of the Living Word, home of Total Restoration Center, where our pastor is Pastor Vander D. Purcell Jr. And now, very, very imperative that we are not fooled with the ministry of airwaves, where everything that we hear, we believe it, because it's on the radio, or because it's on YouTube, or because it's on social media. We, we can't allow just anything into our spirits or even allow it to become a part of our makeover now now your bible says this my bible says that that satan is the prince of the power of the air because he can bring contamination once words have been released into atmospheres. So in this particular time, we can't allow the spirit, watch me, of competition to have a place in ministry. It only brings, or it only births, Sam, it only births more ways to mask our issues and our problems. I'm going to say this and you're not going to like it. That's why people can live any kind of way and run to church. Because we have become professionals at hearing but failures at doing. In this particular time, we, we have created cultures to accommodate, y'all not gonna like this either, to accommodate the things that God himself declares he hates. Yeah, six things which the Lord God hates. Seven, which are an abomination to him. Uh, uh, haughty eyes. A lion tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Uh, a heart that devises wicked plans. Feet. Yeah, them same feet that you shout would. That run rapidly and quickly to evil. And, and, and I know somebody going to say amen on this one. A false witness who utters lies. And, and this is one I know personally because I've been there and done this. And one who spreads strife among the brethren. This is, this is stuff that God himself says he hates. But, but we have created cultures for that stuff to live. And to say it's going to be all right when it's not. Not if God hates it. If God hates it, we should have a problem with it too. Therefore, we should not be partakers of it. Oh, because we are so desperate to accept any and everything just for the sake of saying my church is growing. And, you, and, and those of you pastors and ministers and elders who are listening to me, I want you to hear me closely. I learned this from my father. You can't build with just any and everything. Oh, God. You, you, you can't build with just any and everybody. Therefore, when people have made an exit out of your life, when people have made an exit out of your ministry, you at some point got to understand that maybe God, could not use them for the season you are in. And let's get personal. Sometimes, sometimes it ain't even about ministry. It's about your own personal life. How you go through things. Am I in the house? When you go through stuff. Am I 
in the house and, and you fall apart with people and fall apart with friends and then you want to post how some people shouldn't have never been this, shouldn't have never been that. Maybe that's not it. Maybe God is elevating you. And they can't handle where God is taking you. And you ought to celebrate it because you don't want to have to fight the same demons up there when you were down here. So we we have gotten ourselves into a situation. Because so many of us, Shannon, so many of us... So many of us, Pastor Queenie, have the heart of Herod the king. When he allowed the people in Acts, he allowed the people to scream and declare and decree that his voice was the voice of God. And because he would not correct them by giving God glory, you know what happened? An angel dispatch from heaven came down and struck him because seeking of one's own glory will always result to death are y'all hearing me today don't you ever spend time trying to find glory for yourself because all glory you can preach that belongs to God I want you to remind somebody and yell at them since you are distance from them and tell them all the glory belongs to God. Come on, and this time put some preaching in your voice. I don't know how we do. Say all glory belongs to God. Do we know what we have gotten ourselves into? When we are trying to fit in places that God did not ordain. Do we know, Deacon Hector, the fight we bring amongst ourselves when we are trying to be who God did not destine us to be? And so what we find here is a young man by the name of Hagar. Whose name means festive. Watch this. And he identified himself, watch this, with the time he was in, and God identified him to bring about a change. One way you can be effective where you are is to identify where you are. The problem with many of us is we are trying to change a culture and we don't understand what culture we're in. Are y'all hearing me? Stop trying to change stuff that you haven't been assigned to change. It could possibly be that God is trying to change you. Y'all ain't hearing me. It's amazing that whenever we embark upon something new, the first thing we want to do is change. Change this, change that. But maybe the change needs to come from you. I want you to point at yourself and say, maybe I need to change. I want you to preach it and say, maybe the problem was not him. Maybe the problem was not her. Maybe I needed to take a good look in the mirror and decide that I need to change. Some of you are afraid to look in mirrors because it reminds you of who you really are. I don't care how much makeup and how much lashes and how much hair you cover yourself up with. The mirror reveals who you are. And maybe that's the person that needs the change. It was brother Michael Jackson who says that in order for a change to occur, I must start with a man in the mirror. I want you to find you somebody and yell at them and say, hey neighbor, before you try to change this or try to change that, start with the man in the mirror. Come on and tell God thank you. So so when God chooses to use you, there is something about you that must shift with his agenda. Many of us have had issues because we want to be used by God. We want to be his mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. 
We want to be his vessel. We want to experience his power. But we don't want to change our agenda. God says, watch this, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts, y'all can preach this, of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Somebody praise God for their expected end. Uh, come on and find you somebody and say, I'm waiting on the expected end. Come on and tell them again, say neighbor. I'm blessed because I have an expected end. Come on and prophesy to them and say, neighbor, you've been through this, you've been through that, but your expected end is where the blessings will come. We can never ever get to the expected end with our own agenda. And because God knows what the expected end is, he knows what it takes. Mm. To get us there. How many of you believe that? How many of you know that God knows what it takes to get us to our expected end? I want you to say it like you're being it. God knows what it takes to get me to my expected end. I want you to say it like you're trying to convince someone and say, God knows what it takes to get me to my expected end. So that means if I go through some hardships, it was part of God's plan. If I've been backstabbed, it was part of God's plan. If they fire me from my job, it was part of God's plan. And even if you don't like me, uh, y'all ain't hearing me, maybe it's part of God's plans. So hear me. The, so, so the question becomes this, Pastor Maggie. Uh, how, how then, okay, um, if, if, if because God knows what the expected end is and, and what it takes to get me there, so then how do I know um, how to progress and move toward my expected end? How do I know that? Uh, the, the expected end rests clearly in the thoughts of God. Hear what he said. I know the thoughts I have towards you. Therefore, I'm going to give you an expected end. So if I want to know what the expected end is, I got to get in the thoughts of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man, which is what? In him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So then that means that if I want to know what God is doing in my life, Matika, I need the Spirit of God. Oh, I need the Spirit of God if I'm going to progress in life. Mm -hmm. I need the Spirit of God if I'm going to preach. I need the Spirit of God if I'm going to teach. I need the Spirit of God, Dana, if I'm going to love. I need the Spirit of God if I'm going to sing praise and worship. I need the Spirit of God if I'm going to play the Hammond organ. Y'all ain't hearing me. I said I need the Spirit of God if I'm going to work in his church because the problem is we got too many people working but they lack the spirit of God but I want you to look at somebody and say neighbor that season is over and the devil is a liar from this day forth I'm striving to get the spirit of God I didn't say I'd be perfect I didn't say I wouldn't mess up but I'm striving to get the spirit of God come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you so Hagar has the spirit of God resting upon him to make a spirit or to awake a spirit in God's people. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes God, Donna, will use you to awake the spirit in other people. Y'all ain't hearing me. Sometimes, Pastor Mac, you can walk into a room full of folk with attitude. And because you got God's spirit, you come in and change the whole atmosphere. I wish I was preaching to some happy folk. Sometimes, Sam, you can walk into your job. And because you had a worship session on your way to work, every devil in hell may try to get you to throw in the towel but because you had an encounter with the spirit of the living God when you walk in the room the room has to change I want to preach to some room changes but when I walk on my job although the devil is there when I get there the atmosphere has to change I want to preach to some folks that go to a jacked up church but when I get there everything has to change somebody clap your hands and tell God thank you Hagar has to awake this spirit in God's people the people had been rescued Pastor Maggie from where they were watch this and they begun a work in rebuilding the temple but we have watch this a problem well, Brother Danny, what's the problem? The problem is they started rebuilding, but they stopped. Ooh, I wish I had a church. They started rebuilding, but they stopped. And many of us can identify with this. We start something, but we don't finish it. I bet most of you listening to me have a task at your house right now to where you started doing something. You started painting. Yeah. You started working in the garage. You started working in the closet. But you didn't finish it. And much of the stress that people feel does not come from too much to do. It comes from not finishing what you started. Please, Deacon, understand this. That in a simple race, man, and I said man, celebrates and gives the reward, Pastor Maggie, to the man that finishes first. But hear this. It's not who finishes first. It's not who breaks the tape first. Ah, it's the it's the one that finishes and crosses the line. The purpose is to finish it. Look at somebody and say, just finish it. Find somebody else and say, just finish it. Come on and look at them in the face and say, just finish it. Tell them, I know you started it, but just finish it. I know you begun it, but just finish it. That's why I want to decree to you, don't you let people, Shannon, dim your light because it's shining in their eyes. Finish what you started. I don't know who I'm talking to. Go back to school uh -huh, and finish. Get back on the auxiliary and finish. Get back in the choir and finish. Watch this. Get back to your church. Y'all ain't hearing me. Why? Being confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Come on. That's enough to give God praise for. How many of you can tell God thank you? How many of you can decree today? God, I give you praise. God, I give you glory. God, I give you honor. I got to finish what I started. And it starts right now. Somebody say yeah. All right. So Hagar realizes the issue. The issue. And he says to Zerubbabel, who was the governor, and Joshua, who was the preacher. He says to him, uh, the people said that it's not time to build the Lord's house. 
But then the word of the Lord came to Hagar and says to him, yet you can build your house. Mm. But yet God's house remain in ruin. Consider your ways. You keep giving and you're bringing in a little bit. You eat, watch me y'all, and you're still hungry. Y'all ain't hearing me. You drink and you're still thirsty. You clothe yourself and you're still not warm. Watch this. And the bag you put your money in has holes in it. God said everything you do will fail because you have become content with the way my house is. God said, I can't, watch this, God says this, I heard the Lord, Pastor Maggie, say this, why do you expect me to bless your house when you don't even have a desire to bless mine? I said, it doesn't work that way. If, hear me, if you want your house blessed, you got to bless the house of the Lord. So the man of God gives Zerubbabel, Hagar, he gives Zerubbabel and Joshua specific instructions. And he says to them, go to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. And God says, I will take pleasure in it and be glorified. This is what the Lord says. The problem is they were used to seeing buildings that were of worthy and better material, okay? They were discouraged, Pastor Queenie, because they were used to seeing the type of buildings, the type of church that Solomon built. Because Solomon had accessibility to the mountains of Lebanon, okay? Watch me now. Lebanon had better wood. And if you have better wood, you could build better things. But what God was saying, I'm not concerned about what you use. I'm concerned that whatever you build, I would be able to dwell therein. Let me help you. Many of us have got it all wrong. We feel that if it's a big, glamorous place, that God is there. We feel like, oh, if everybody goes there, God has to be there. We feel, oh, girl, ooh, girl, look at him. He is so fine. I just know he's the one for me. Ooh, did you see that brother? How she is just so fine, and we get caught up in appearances. Mm. Many of us have been fooled. Who can be honest? I've been fooled by appearances. Listen, light travels faster than sound. That's why many people look smart until they speak. And once they speak, you find out, watch this, just how crazy and cuckoo that they really are. Don't ever allow yourself to be intimidated, Pastor Queenie, or threatened, Pastor Maggie, or afraid, Sam, or distracted by someone's title, position, or status. The people, this is going to bless you right here, who stood outside of Lazarus' tomb needed more help than Lazarus who was in the tomb because they were looking at the appearance of the matter. Therefore, Jesus, watch this, wasn't reaping for Lazarus. He was reaping for them because they did not know that the one who gave life was about to bring back life. They didn't know that the one that said, I am the resurrection was standing right in front of them. Don't you ever look, get caught up in the appearance of things. Somebody tell God, thank you. So God said, you look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, God said, I, I blew on it because the way you left my house. God said, I closed the heavens, Pastor Mackie, over you and suspended the earth from yielding and whatever you did, it was fruitless. Why? Because of the way you left my house. Mm. 
But watch what God says. And God shows me that in verse number 12, Zerubbabel and Joshua finally call it. And they said to the people, we've got to do what the word of the Lord says. So they obeyed the voice of God and the God and the word of Hagar. And, they, and the God sent him and the people, watch this, fear before the Lord. Watch this. And in verse 14, hear me, the Lord stirred mm, up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, and, and, and the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord. I start praying, Pastor. I said, God, what are you saying to me? And God says to me, Donna, don't ever forget what's in between obeying and doing. I said, well, God, what is it? He said, he said, he said, Hagar spoke to them and said to them that the Lord said, I am with you. I am with you, which means what? That a lot of times, many of us are in between verse 12 and verse 14. And I come to be your FedEx delivery man today. And to let you know that you already obeyed the word. And you're already working. But I in between that, God showed me and told me to tell you that he is with us. I know it's a pandemic. But God sends me to tell you, I am with you. And as long as God is with us, us. Everything that come up against us shall fail. I want you to find you a neighbor and preach to them and say, neighbor, I want to remind you, number one, I didn't come to play church, but I come to let you know that the man of God, the man of God said that God is with us. When you pass through the waters, he said, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Because God, because God is with you. Somebody shout glory. Somebody shout glory. He said, be content with what you have. For he himself has said in the word, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Wherever there's two or three gathered in my name, I shall be with you. Open up your mouth and tell God thank you. And say, Lord, I thank you for being with me. Lord, I praise you for being with me. Lord, I give you glory for being with me. Say yes. God had not been with us, we would have been dead a long time ago. But it was God, His grace, and His mercy. He kept us when we wanted to give up. It was God who kept us when we was messing up in our minds. It was God. It was God. It was God. I am with you. I am with you. Open your mouth and give God praise. He, in Moses' closing message, he was on his way out of here. Here's what he told the children of Israel, Deacon. He said, The Lord, He is the one. Hey, 
who goes before you. I believe y'all missed that. Pastor, what is your main pastor? He is the one that goes before you. Which means if he's going before us, that means I'm following him. Watch what he says. And if he goes before you, Latika, he will be with you. And will not leave you. And will not forsake you. Do not fear. Oh, God. Nor be dismayed. I want you to tell somebody I ain't scared. Because I know who with me. Okay, let me, let me make this real to you. I remember one time, I was a little young fella, Deacon, but I used to play football at Pillar Center. Me and, me and, Pastor, uh, me and Pastor Anthony, we, we were, I was a little fella. Pastor Anthony was a lot bigger than me. Uh, but I was a little young fella. And the, and the guys at Pillar Center would pick on me because I was, I, was, I was fast and I was quick but I was small. Let me say it again. I was fast. I was quick. But I was small. And they would pick on me. They would say, eh, he come per se. He weigh a buck over five. If somebody hit him too hard, they're going to crush him. They would pick on me. But one particular time, I went up there to rail with my mama. Y- y'all ain't hearing me. And y'all know my mama ain't scared of nothing. She got out of the car limping like she do. And she said, come on up here. Now, for some reason, I got a, I got a, a, a strange strength of fire. Y- y'all ain't hearing me. I got that, that light blue Buick, Deacon. You remember that one? That light blue Electra 225. Some of y'all are too young to know about that. But it was, it was called a deuce and a quarter. And, 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 and I got out that car with the fabric seats. I got out that car. And I had so much energy. Because although practice was the same, I felt like I was somebody. Because my mama, y'all, y'all ain't here. My mama was with me. And I went out there and I played football. And they said, man, you, you're pretty hyper today. I said, yeah. I felt like I was somebody. Next day, it was back to normal. Y'all, y'all ain't hearing me. Well, why, why would you say that, Pastor? Because when my mama was with me, I felt like I was more. I felt like I could do it. And I want you to know that when you go on that job interview, when you go to that bank, when you go to that business proportional, God! God! Is with you. You don't have to be afraid. Are you hearing me? And and Jesus, as he reappeared to the disciples, he said something to them. He says, teaching you to observe everything I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. What does that mean? That means when we get to the very end, he is always with us. Rest to your feet today. That's it. Because he first loved me. Because he first loved me. Yeah.